So uh, it's indeed an honor to be able to interview you in this forum, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. So Professor Aspinwall, welcome very much. Sure, it's a great honor much. to have you here. Yeah. And the first question is, um, you've had the opportunity to teach all over the world and were you able to observe many differences in cultural diplomacy, especially, for example, maybe between China and the US? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And uh, I would I would say absolutely yes. I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd give the example of between China and Cuba, actually. Let me say what I mean. Teaching uh, the Chinese uh, starting in the late 90s, it was interesting for me because they... Um, Personally, the students are very uh, well-behaved, very quiet, very still. They sit there uh, for they can sit through a class for hours at a time without um, without protesting or you know shifting around or anything like that. And it, after a time, it was possible to get them to open up and have a kind of full debate on things that they otherwise under the communist regime might have been uncomfortable debating but within the classroom they opened up and they 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 were very good about it uh, about debating openly and having different points of view that's the key thing as a teacher in a classroom you want to try to generate um, debate so you, you ha you're, you're, you're finding dilemmas and divisions and differences uh, on purpose you're trying to do that in Cuba it's it was exactly the opposite the students were um, mature master students with careers and although um, their own behavior was much more relaxed. They would get stand up and leave the classroom. They smoke in class. They they shout to each other in the classroom. They leave in the middle of it, you know, and then they come back with a coffee, you know, while I'm talking. Uh, but the, you couldn't generate. I mean, uh, talking to them about what's the future of Cuba under a globalized system? Is it going to become more liberalized and open? And they wouldn't debate it at all. You could not get anything to split them apart into different camps. And that's what you look for in a classroom um, because they were worried about it. Uh, so I, I, I would say I noticed those. I haven't taught in the U.S. for quite a while, but uh, those, those differences are, are significant. And in, and in the U.K., I suppose they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they're you know, uh, very, very good about spotting um, 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 intellectual division and so forth and exploiting that. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, also, so how have you seen cultural diplomacy evolve throughout your career? You've obviously been uh, teaching for quite a while. And also, what do you think is the future of cult cultural diplomacy? Where can you see it going next? Well, um, there are institutions that promote culture uh, from on behalf of states or on behalf of languages, for example, uh, with, and some of them have grown quite a lot over my career, like the Conf or come into existence, like the Confucius Institute, which is now so numerous, uh, and we have we have a one of them in, in Edinburgh, for example, and that's a very impressive change. So there's much more, and there's also more travel, more more likelihood to take a year off before students begin university and then also more likelihood for students to choose to study abroad for their third year. Uh, and that, I think, is extremely positive. Now, students go and they, they learn about another place, they learn about another culture, they learn about, um, they, 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 they take courses within another university, so they learn quite, um, you know, quite a lot about other places. What I'd like to see more of, and I think this actually may be on the decline, is uh, Anglophone students learning foreign languages. Because language, if you talk about cultural diplomacy, language is one of the most important ways actually to make that work properly. Without, yeah. without uh, Spanish, uh, I would not have, uh, I wouldn't near, know nearly as much about Mexico mm. as I do, and, or about my, my Mexican uh, in-laws or the family or, or society. You have to have that language. And the, the British students and the American students uh, and other Anglophones are really, really reluctant, m more so than they used to be, and unfortunately more than, than other parts of the world. They're reluctant to learn other languages. So I think that's a disappointment still, but, but um, in terms of travel and experience and um, education in other parts of the world, that has grown. That's good. And then uh, you are currently a professor at the University of Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, there's been much talk about uh, Scotland gaining its independence. And do you think cultural diplomacy could be used in this situation, maybe like creating more affinity for the United Kingdom? Yeah, so yeah. Um, possibly. I mean, I think already the Scots and the English uh, especially know a lot about each other. The Scots know about the Irish, the Scots know about the Welsh, but the Scots and the English, I mean, there's very little new to be learned, I think, and they're so, so integrated in every sense of the world, even more than, than with the um, European Union. 
Uh, and so I don't think there's a huge amount new to teach them. I, I think oftentimes what these boil down to, and this is a point I made upstairs, uh, is self-interest and particularly material self-interest. And um, the calculations by, by the Scots will be, what will this mean for me economically? And that, in a, in a nutshell, um, when it comes to it, determines a lot of the, the, the attitudes, the voting behavior, the positions, um, the pros and the cons and the interests of people, rather than um, um, you know, knowing more about or, or, or you know, practicing cultural diplomacy of one kind or another. The, and in fact, the values, the, the basic underlying values which underpin their culture are broadly speaking very similar. There, there, there's some differences in law and in church and education systems that they, that they like to talk about. But I think you scratch the surface. They're very similar already. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh -huh. Okay, you're from over there. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland. So, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. we have a lot of Scottish friends yeah, and a lot yeah, of them yeah. feel very strongly you know they're Scottish they're not not yeah, British not right. UK so they, they can be that and, that and that's important but that's not going to make them vote for independence yeah yeah. I don't think I a lot of them personally I mean. believe I think it should be a stay with the United Kingdom see how okay. <laughs> that goes um, so um, now I'm going moving to a much the much more theoretical level. Um, you are a specialist on political economy. Uh, do you think that um, cultural diplomacy has a place in bargaining theory, which is much more mathematical? And not a, um, and um, can cultural diplomacy be a source for bargaining power in terms of indirect influence on the opponent? The the second part of the question you have to repeat in a moment because I didn't catch it. But uh, in the first the first bits. Um, Cultural diplomacy could conceivably, I mean, my friend Gerald Schneider, who you know very well, uh, um, says that anything can be modeled, any, any question can be modeled theoretically, including uh, sociological ones or cultural ones, but you have to specify the, the, um, the, the aspects or the variables or the aspects of what you're trying to test and then, and then, and then operationalize it and test it you know, somehow. So it's conceivable that it could be uh, cultural diplomacy. I think actually it is um, in some ways vaguely, too, a little too vaguely specified what it means. Um, what, what is the basis of it? And I, I, because I was coming here, I did a bit of research on it to try to figure it out. And I know that, I know that it's about um, cultural interchange and education and understanding um, other systems better and so forth. Um, But that doesn't necessarily lead to a prediction about something. It doesn't necessarily lead to an outcome. Um, it, it leads to maybe to better understanding. But then the question, like we were talking about soft power, the question is, a, it's a kind of what you would say is a so what question. What does it mean? What does it lead to? Uh, is, if we understand each other better or we have more exposure to other cultures and other um, uh, other value systems and other art systems and so forth, does that mean that we're going to like each other better or cooperate better, have less conflict. Uh, and the, the implication often is that, yes, but I don't think that's the case. In fact, in fact we, we were hearing from Ian Gillen um, how, music, how music can be divisive, how it can, it's, it's new, it's rebellious. The Sex Pistols in the 1970s, Deep Purple wasn't uh, allowed to be played in certain places. And, uh, and it's precisely because art is trying to make a point against some system of power that it gets excluded, that it's divisive, that uh, and so forth, at least until it then is recognized as playing an important role in, 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 in building consciousness. And, then, and that's really important. So, I mean, to answer your question, uh, I think it needs to be, under, you know, the, the way that cultural diplomacy may work needs to be understood a bit better first. Now, the second part of your question you asked me about can be a source for bargaining power, indirect. I think maybe I've answered this a bit. Yeah. Um, um, it can, but you know, also, I mean, I was thinking in the, I think it was around 1988-89 when the U.S. military was sent down to Panama to get Manuel Noriega, the, the, um, the, the Panamanian leader at the time. And he went into hiding in, I think, in the embassy of the Vatican in Panama. And, and the U.S., you know, didn't go in and get him out because in international law, you're not supposed to do that. What they did instead was to play rock music 24 hours a day at volume 11 outside the embassy to, to basically harass everybody until he voluntarily gave himself up. That's, that's culture. That's, I don't know what music it was. Maybe it was Black Sabbath, in fact, in a bad way. 
Yeah. 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 So, Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, my next question would be um, more on the European Union, since we before talked also about yeah. the euro crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Some say that through the European financial crisis, the EU institutions, such as the European Central Bank, have been considerable considerably strengthened, which means a step forward towards integration. To what extent do you agree, and is the EU the big winner or the big loser in this crisis? Well, we don't know yet. I think the EU could be the big winner uh, and it could also be the big loser. Um, it'll be it'll lose if it, if it loses members of the Eurozone, and that's still uh, uncertain. I think um, it's it's probably unlikely that it'll lose members, but we don't know that yet, and I, I don't think it's safe to make a prediction on it, really. Um, I think we'll probably muddle along in a crisis state until, you know, I mean, for, for, for some foreseeable um, time right now, until the weaker economies, those that are less productive, particularly the Greek one, uh, they can find a way out of their of the sovereign debt crisis. I think that the European, that the central institutions will probably be strengthened, though, uh, and that includes um, the European Central Bank and other other aspects. The hope of the Parliament. Also. Possibly the possibly the Parliament, yeah. But I mean, in, in, I mean, in order, especially if more powers are given to the to the Commission or the um, the system by which uh, states are bailed out or or, or um, you know lending is made to them within the e, within the eurozone. So. So, uh, if those are strengthened, then, it's, then, it's, then it is likely that demo democratic accountability will be strengthened through parliamentary strengthening too. So it's, qu it's quite possible that, that will happen, but that doesn't, that, that's a winner in, in the sense of the institutions themselves being strengthened, but it doesn't necessarily mean that overall the EU is a winner because, because of, of the effect on public opinion, because the, you know, the effect on the morale. I mean, the Spanish, the Greeks, they don't see the European Union as a source of, you know... See them as an enemy. Yeah, exactly. The rules, the, the, the very, very slow and grudging um, assistance that, that has been forthcoming. And so, um, uh, and so in terms of public support and uh, de democratic accountability, credibility and legitimacy, it's still a very, very uncertain situation, I think. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for being here today. It was an honor and a privilege to be able to interview you. Thank you very much.